If we blame our sin on our parents, on our spouse, on our work, on our environment, on our history, we have avoided it. Charles Price talked about the difference between a superficial response to sin and a serious response to sin. How can we tell which response we are having? And it wasn't until after I had left that situation with these guys that I actually had my encounter with God. Discipline is not a word that many of us like to hear. Certainly our children don't like it. But however painful, it is an essential part of growing up. Children may not thank us for it now, but in the end, they know they are disciplined because they are loved. Today, in the series Issues of the Heart, Charles Price looks at the consequences of David's sin and how he had to be disciplined or chastened by God. Through the painful long-term effects of his adultery, God begins to mend David's heart and life. There was no quick fix, no way to restore everything that had been lost, but there was always a way forward because David was loved by God. This is Living Truth. Good morning. If you turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel this morning, we're going to continue looking as we've been for a number of weeks at events in the life of David, to whom there's given a lot of space in the Old Testament scriptures. If you saw the bulletin as you came in, you will notice that the passage we're going to look at covers seven chapters. Second Simon chapter 12 to chapter 18. I'm not going to read those to you because there wouldn't be time to do anything else. But I'm going to pick out one or two things from those chapters that I think will be helpful to us on one central theme as to how we respond to sin. That is crucial to our well-being. And if I have a verse that will serve as a good launch for this, it will be 2 Samuel chapter 14 and the second part of verse 14, 2 Samuel 14, 14, the second half of this verse, which says, but God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. God devises ways that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. In these chapters, we're going to look at two responses to sin. One is a serious response to sin. The other is a superficial response to sin. The first is David's response to God when God brought conviction to him for sin in his life. The second, the superficial response, is the relationship that David had with his son Absalom that illustrates a kind of forgiveness that is superficial in its source and superficial in its effect. And it's the kind of response to our sin that many of us would like to receive from God. And that's where we're going to talk about it. Let me look at then at the, what I'm going to call a serious response to sin. You remember that after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had her husband Uriah sent to the front line and put in a position of certain death, in order that David then could take Bathsheba and no one would know he was the father of her baby for she had been found to be pregnant and to make her his wife. It was after that the prophet Nathan came to David with a parable that we talked about last week that brought a deep conviction of sin into David's life. And I want to read you two statements that Nathan made 
to David. The first is in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 10, where God said, Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despise me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. That is a solemn judgment. The sword will never depart from your house. And three verses later in verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Now there are two statements that I want to talk about. The Lord has taken away your sin is one statement, but the sword will never depart from your house is the other statement, both related to the sin of David in his adultery with Bathsheba. You see, our sin is either under the judgment of God when it is not confessed, or it is under the discipline of God when it has been confessed. Now, I want to show that from this passage. The person God forgives of deliberate, willful sin sometimes has to drink deeply of the well that he has tapped in that sin. There is collateral damage from sin. It's not a shrug your shoulders and it's all over with response that we make to God. And usually that damage is to those we love most. And David has sown something into his life. He has sown something into his family. He's sown something into the nation that will continue to pay back in some way. And the events that followed in David's life were not because God had not forgiven him, but because God had forgiven him. But now there is a discipline of God which comes into his life to mold him and make him the person that he had broken in his act of sin. And it's in God's kindness that he disciplines us in order to remold us and remake us. David has sown a wind, and he is going to reap a whirlwind. We're going to read about that in a moment. But it is a whirlwind that brings discipline and correction and a training in righteousness. To quote the New Testament, speaking of the effect of the word of God, to correct, to train in righteousness. And if I have a text for today, it's not written by David. It's written by his son, Solomon. Solomon was born to Bathsheba, not her firstborn who died, but a secondborn to Bathsheba from David was his son Solomon, who of course became his successor on the throne of Israel. And Solomon writes in Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son, he delights in. The discipline of God is a love story. We sang about how that I'm loved by God. That isn't always comfortable. Sometimes the love of God is expressed in ways which are painful because the Lord disciplines those he loves wrote Solomon, as the father, the son, he delights in. Because he loves David, because he delights in David, because he loves you, he delights in you, he disciplines, he chastises, he corrects. You see, the story of David and Bathsheba is not the love story. That is a story of lust, a story of pride, a story of cover-up, a story of death. It is the painful discipline of God in response to that that is the love story in this passage. 
David, God loved David. God delighted in David. Therefore, he disciplined David. Now, let me go back to chapter 12, verse 10 that I read at the beginning. Now, therefore, God said to David through Nathan the prophet, now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me. That, by the way, was the root of David's sin. Because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and I point out last week, she's never called the wife of David, never called Bathsheba, she's called the wife of Uriah the Hittite, even into the New Testament. Reminding David of his sin, you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And because of that, the sword will not depart from your house. Sin cannot be hidden. It may lay silent. It may be covered over. But in the end, it will reveal itself. Because as I quoted last week, and I'm building on from that, in Numbers 32, 23, where... God said to Moses, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. Not your friends will find you out. Not your wife will find you out. Not your husband will find you out. Not your parents will find you out. Not your kids will find you out. Your sin itself will find you out. Because it is a virus that spreads poison through your system. And it will expose itself. It will expose itself and find you out. Asaph in Psalm 79 verse 8 prayed something which the Old Testament talks about, but he prayed against this thing. Do not hold against us the sin of our fathers. Because several times in Scripture, it speaks of a trickle-down effect of our sin to our children, our children's children, down to the third and fourth generation. In fact, that's in Exodus 34 and verse 7. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. There is this trickle-down effect. And it was understood that way, which is why when Jesus came upon a man who had been blind from birth, you remember, the disciples asked him a question that to us sounds a very strange, unnecessary question. We wouldn't ask it. But they said, who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because they understood that sometimes the sins of the parents do trickle down to the children. But Jesus said, this has nothing to do with sin, nothing at all to do with either his sin or his parents' sin. This man's blindness has another effect, which is going to be for the glory of God, he said. But there is this natural law. Now, the good news of the gospel under the new covenant is this natural law can be broken. Because in Jeremiah 31, verse 29, when Jeremiah writes about the new covenant, he says, in those days, people will no longer say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, Everyone will die for his own sins. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Now, under the new covenant, that chain is broken. That stronghold is broken. Under the new covenant, if we're inclined to blame our parents, we don't need to. We can start afresh with God, and the sour grapes of our parents need not set the children's teeth on edge, is, is what Jeremiah writes about there. However, for David, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me. In chapter 13, you find, I won't read it, but you find there David's firstborn son, whose name was Amnon, raped his half-sister Tamor, driven by what he called love, but which turned out to be hatred. Because in chapter 13, verse 1, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom. She was the full sister of Absalom, one of David's sons, the half-sister of Amnon. 
It tells how he tried to woo her, then he tried to seduce her, and then eventually, because she resisted, he raped her. And verse 15 says, Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Well, he'd never loved her. He just loved himself. He was driven by lust, which when it was over, the deed was done, expressed its true nature. It was hatred. And he hated her with intense hatred. And Amnon said to her, when it was all over, get up and get out. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornamented robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away weeping as she went. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. Lust is made up of hatred. Though we can kid ourselves and confuse ourselves, as Amnon did, no, this is love. Now, this is totally selfish, self-centered lust. And verse 21 says, when King David heard all this, he was furious. But how could David rebuke his son for a sin which he himself had committed? Some of us may look at our life or that of our family, and despair that we will always be stuck in cycles of sin. Perhaps there has been alcoholism or divorce or anger for generations. But because of the hope that we have in Christ, that stronghold has been broken. We can start afresh with God. However, sin is a virus that if we don't deal with properly, can spread its poison to those around us. It's not enough to just say sorry. It's not enough to enjoy the freedom of a clean conscience. We have to find the root or the cause of our sin. God helps us dig up that root by chastening us. It is hard work in the deepest part of our heart, but it is always constructive when it is by God's hand. Sometimes we come from a history of sin that is beyond our control. This story is about a young woman who tried to break the cycle of sin only to find herself part of it. My mom was a single parent. She raised my older sister, my younger brother, um, and myself on her own, and she couldn't cope. So she abused drugs quite a bit. She was very, very abusive, and that's kind of where my story starts. My mom was very absent. She was in the house, but she was not a parent. I started taking care of my brother and I was about four and a half, um, and it was shortly after that I remember changing diapers, and then it was more full-time when I was 10. I left when I was 15, and I decided to complete my high school while working and college as well. I got my diploma in finance, and from there I started working. I got a really good job with you know, one of the biggest banks. I was working in their head office, and I was making really good money, and about six months in, I ended up quitting my job. I was looking around and I was like really good in sales and I was approached by this guy who I had met through mutual friends. He was working for this multi-level marketing company. He was supposed to teach me like what to do, like how to be successful. Somehow or another, he had convinced me to start working in strip clubs. So <laughs> my mentor in this multi-level marketing company, he ended up becoming my pimp from the strip club. I was moved into a hotel, and from the hotel, I ended up being held captive in a condo. That's really when I realized this is not a situation I want to be in, but I couldn't leave because I was terrified of what would happen to me or my family. I just didn't know what to do. And honestly, like I can't even tell you how long I was there. The guys that would come to see me, you know, they ranged from young men um, up to very old men. They were just from all different walks of life. You know, some were professional, some were you know, just regular people. I definitely think that these men are to blame. The reason is, you know, if they didn't have money to put on the table, then these women, they wouldn't be trafficked. There would be no need for a pimp because there's no money. In the beginning, I always thought that I could leave whenever I wanted. And I think it was a lie that I told myself just to make myself feel comfortable. 
you know, they did some pretty awful things. When I really started to realize that there's nothing I can do, I knew my only way out was death. And it wasn't until one random day, and I have no idea why this happened. The place I was being held in was raided by police um, from a different district um, than we were living in. He had gotten arrested, actually fled the province. That's when my phone started ringing all the time. I was getting phone calls, threats, and you know, Facebook messages and text messages. And I walked into a police station. I just wanted to file harassment or threats or whatever I possibly could where I could just put their names on file, you know? You know, I ended up reaching like the end and I was like, listen, like what if we file human trafficking? That's when the entire police station just stood up and they all started moving around. And it's like all of a sudden they just, everybody just wanted to help. Laura is taking her pimp to court and is pressing charges of human trafficking. Her heart for Christ has given her strength to face the demons in her life. It was, it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And it wasn't until after I had left that situation with these guys that I actually had my encounter with God. Like once I had my encounter, I started to realize that really he had his hand in everything because there were so many situations that just don't make sense, but they do now. Sometimes it seems like you're alone, but really you're not. You know, there are, like I said, there's people you can talk to, but you know, just even praying and just having faith in God, like that definitely can help. And you know, God is the only person who can change everything in an instant. And you know, realistically, if you end up in a situation like this, just call out to God. Tamar's brother, Absalom, seized inside at this for two years. And after two years, Absalom invited Amnon to a party. He'd hated Amnon during those two years. He got him drunk. And in chapter 13, verse 28, Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Have I not given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. They killed him in revenge. And then later in the chapter, verse 30, it says, the report came to David, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, not one of them is left. The king stood up, tore his clothes, lay down on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, said, my lord should not think that they killed all the princes, only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. So there's havoc in his family now. One son is murdering another because of the uh, raping of Absalom's sister. But how could David discipline Amnon for murder when faced with the murder of Uriah that he had been responsible for? How could David discipline Absalom for getting Amnon drunk in order to abuse him when David had got Uriah drunk in order to take advantage of him? But it hadn't worked. This is why we have to deal very deeply with our sin. Because it's a virus within us if we don't deal with it that spreads its poison. It's not enough to say sorry when we sin. Simply not enough. 
We have to go down to its cause, down to its roots. Psalm 51 is a psalm to read and meditate on in the light of all of these details because the heading of that psalm, probably in your Bible, is this. This is a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. If you want to know the state of David's heart and mind and spirit, you have to read Psalm 51 after his adultery had been pointed out to him. And he cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. This is David now pleading for cleansing and washing. But he doesn't stop there. In verse 6, he says, Surely you, you desire truth in the inner parts. You require wisdom in the inmost places. That's where I have to go, says David, into the inner part. That's where my lust was living. That's where my greed was living. That's where my pride is living. It's not just saying sorry for the symptoms of that, but going down into the inner place, the inmost place, the inner parts of me, he says. And then in verse 10, he cries out, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me because my spirit is broken and it's contaminated. And David takes his repentance from simply being sorry for what he's done into the inner part of his life, into the inmost place to seek a pure heart, to seek a renewed spirit within him. And this is not merely looking for the benefit of a clean conscience. I know that appetite. Let's get my conscience clean. But let's not go deep into the source and do the, the hard work of understanding it and rooting it out. It's easy just to enjoy the freedom of a clean conscience. We don't deal with the root. We don't go to the cause. We don't go to the inmost place, into the inner parts, into the heart, into the spirit, as David speaks about. And to help us get there is the chastening hand of God. The chastening hand of God is never destructive. It's always constructive if we listen to it and we take it and we go with it and we do the hard work that it demands of us in the inmost part. If we excuse any sin just casually, we avoid it. Don't have to deal with it. We've excused it. If we blame any cause outside of ourselves and we land on an explanation for our sin which is out there somewhere or back there somewhere, we have avoided our sin. If we blame our sin on our parents, on our spouse, on our work, on our environment, on our history, we have avoided it. We have to go where David went. And in Psalm 139 and verse 23, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David is pleading with God then to search him. And it's all about me. That's where the problem lies. Search me. Know me. Test me. Know my thoughts. Identify the offensive way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. It may take time. It may be painful. But let's guard into the deepest parts of our own soul. And we do not deal with sin until we've dealt in that way with it. This is what I've called the serious response to sin. But there is a superficial response to sin as well. And this is illustrated in David's broken relationship with his son Absalom. Absalom was his third son. And I mentioned him just now because he had killed Amnon. 
And David was furious after that, but did nothing towards Absalom because he had no moral grounds on which to do anything. He himself had been guilty of similar sins. But after Absalom being away from David, he decided to try and bring about a reconciliation. David loved his son Absalom. Chapter 13 and verse 38 says, Absalom fled and went to Geshur. He stayed there three years and the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom. Here we see David as a loving father who despite the great wrong that had taken place, longed to be reconciled to his son. But however much he longed to be reconciled to his son, his son's actions, his son's sin, had separated them from each other. And so David invites him to come back to Jerusalem so he's no longer a fugitive, no longer having to be running and hiding from David. He can now live in peace in Jerusalem, but because there was no real repentance in his heart, there was no real restoration to David, only a legal arrangement that gets him off the hook. So in verse 23, Joab brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. Verse 28, Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. What's the significance of that? Absalom is back home, but there is no fellowship restored, no communion with David, just a legal standing without the love and intimacy between them. He is brought back to the land, but he is not brought back to the father. And we can settle for that kind of forgiveness, that kind of relationship. Sometimes all we want from God is forgiveness. That's all we want. We want a technical relationship that we assume comes when we pray what people call the sinner's prayer. So we feel legally we're off the hook. We're over the line of salvation. We're in by the skin of our teeth. But there's no active fellowship with God. There's no growing relationship with God. This is the superficial forgiveness. It's a forgiveness that wants to experience being forgiven primarily to ease our guilty conscience. That isn't the kind of forgiveness that God offers. It's this forgiveness of no real change of heart. And Absalom's heart has not been changed. It's just been made convenient for him to live no longer under the law, no longer under threat. But his relationship with David is never restored. The heart is the action center of our lives. It governs our character. It's where we feel, dream, and decide. This series, Issues of the Heart, examines the story of David and drills down to study the internal conflict within our hearts, the battle between the flesh and the spirit. This series by Charles Price is available on CD and DVD. Learn at home, give to a friend, or plan a group Bible study. To order this series, write to the address on your screen or call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. To order online, visit livingtruth.ca or simply text BY to our toll-free number. Through challenges and triumphs, God knows our heart. David loved his son Absalom, but he didn't feel he had the right to chastise him because of his own track record. So he allowed a painful separation to continue. It took another story from a Tekoan lady this time to get through to David's heart. Then he brings Absalom back to the city, but never actually brings him back home. So often we convince ourselves that we have dealt with a situation when we have not. If we try to patch up a broken relationship without dealing with the sin and hurt that took place, there can never be true reconciliation. This is also true of our relationship with God. We don't just want forgiveness from Him when we sin. We want to restore our fellowship with Him. 
Let's return to the message. Now, if you read the story, and some of you know it, of Absalom, he became a very popular man in Israel. He had great charisma. He was good looking. He was, had no blemish, it, it tells us. He, he loved his beautiful long hair, which uh, apparently on one occasion weighed up to five pounds. That's, that's a lot of hair. He was spoiled. He was arrogant. He expected his own way. His will was never broken because his relationship with his father was never restored. True repentance breaks our will, by the way. It breaks the desire for my own way, for my own plans, my own desires, my own pleasures. Reconciliation without brokenness is not real. Repentance is not real forgiveness. David wrote in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Saying sorry and pleading for forgiveness is not enough. It is the breaking of our hearts and the breaking of our spirits has to come about over our sin. And forgiveness without brokenness permits us just to sin again. A cheap, easy sense of forgiveness may actually encourage us to sin because we have this idea that if I sin and I confess it, God forgives me, so I sin and confess, and God forgives, I sin and confess, I sin and confess, I sin and confess, I sin and confess. Unless we learn to hate sin, we'll be crawling back to God again and again with the same issue. And our sense of cheap, easy forgiveness will actually encourage us to do it. I can always be forgiven. The old saying, forgiveness is easier to obtain than permission. Well, just get forgiven. Do it anyway. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he defined cheap grace as forgiveness without repentance. I'm quoting what he said about it now. Forgiveness without repentance, baptism without discipline, communion without confession, grace without discipleship, Grace without the cross, grace without the Lordship of Christ. That's his quote. The benefits of the gospel, in other words, without the cost of surrender to God and a superficial sense of sin is satisfied with a superficial forgiveness. Now, I know in my own heart, that the more you permit sin, maybe some favorite little sin, the more superficial becomes your sense of forgiveness and your sense of holiness before God. William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, exactly 150 years ago, wrote at the end of the 19th century concerning the 20th century, which was just about to break on them. He said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without without hell. Just a veneer of I'm feeling good because I'm forgiven, but no depth, no substance. Absalom illustrates this. He had all the benefits of being reconciled to the nation of Israel, living again in the city, but none of the costs, none of the responsibilities. He's restored to Jerusalem, but no business with the king himself. He didn't see the king's face for two years. No fellowship, no deepening relationship. 
And salvation is not just coming out of our sin, it's coming into this relationship that's alive and central to our lives. We come out of the old life in order to come into this life of fellowship with God. There's a, there's a hymn, some of you who are older will know this hymn, it was an evangelistic hymn. That when I grew up, we used to sing it a lot, and it captures this well. It says, out of my bondage, sorrow and night. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into your freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to you. Out of my sickness, into your health. Out of my want, into your wealth. Out of my sin, into yourself. Jesus, I come to you. And sometimes the Christian life we want is out of my bondage, out of my sickness, out of my want, out of my sin. It's purely for convenience and comfort and an easy conscience. That was the forgiveness Absalom had been given and received. Just changed his legal status, but nothing more. And it's a picture of that superficial forgiveness often we're we're looking for. And Absalom, having come out of the judgment of David, never came in to fellowship with David and so lived in Jerusalem. And for two years, he never saw the king's face. And for two years, he was never interested in seeing the king's face. And so the story gets worse. Absalom wants to become the chief judge in the land. He wants to succeed to the throne in the land, so he makes trouble. He doesn't have to be clever to make trouble, and he starts to make trouble. And he agitates, and he stirs up, and he offers people the world if they will get behind him, and they fall for it. In chapter 15 and verse 6, it says, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And uh, chapter 15, verse 13 says, a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. He won their hearts. And when you win someone's heart, you then win their mind. And when you win their mind, you can then win their will. You get people's hearts, you've got their minds. Get their minds, you get their wills. You ask any advertiser, I was reading a thing on, on does advertising work? It says it doesn't work instantly. It works over a period of time. It creates some kind of warmth to get your heart, first of all. That's the skill of advertising. And once you've identified something warm, you begin to want it. It affects your mind. It affects your will. And so Absalom now mobilizes the people to try and take the throne from David. He gets an army of 12,000 men together and all kinds of intrigues and double crossings take place. The first is to create terror in the nation. It tells us that in chapter 17, strike the people with terror. It's an old tactic. We, we, we use the word terrorism for that today, but it's an old tactic. People then flee because they're insecure, uncertain, and... Uh, Many of the nation fled from Jerusalem, leaving David exposed so that Absalom would then, he thought, come in and kill him. And you can read the story for yourself. Then you have the pathetic picture of David running up the Mount of Olives to get away from Absalom. And as he's running up the Mount of Olives, he's weeping. Why is he weeping? Is it because he may lose his throne? No, I suggest he is weeping because his forgiven son is still his enemy. There's never been reconciliation, never been brought into fellowship together. And David sent his men to fight against Absalom and his 12,000 men, and he gave them this instruction, be gentle with Absalom, be gentle with him. But in pursuit, Absalom got his hair caught in a tree as he was riding his mule underneath it. And the mule kept going, and Absalom hung by his hair. And somebody sent word to Joab, David's commander, Absalom's hanging in a tree. So he went up there, and it was Joab who put three javelins into the heart of Absalom, and he was killed. He went back with his message, and in chapter 18, it says, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. 
As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the weeping of a father who had extended forgiveness but never known reconciliation and relationship on the part of the forgiven person. It had been only a superficial forgiveness. Is that the kind we want from God? We just want God to clean us up so we're clean? Our conscience is easy. Do you want forgiveness? We don't expect then to have to go deep into the inner heart, inner soul. Examine, asking God to examine our hearts. Do we want to understand the root that lies behind them and deal with that root? Am I forgiven, but I have my favorite sin over here? No, God, you don't have access to that. You can clean it because I'll need cleaning it every once in a while, but this is my favorite sin. This is my habitual sin. This is my, this is my, my besetting sin, whatever term we want to use for it. And we don't allow God into the depths of that sin deeply with soul-searching true repentance. There's a serious response to sin which leads to serious repentance which leads to brokenness, which leads to wholeness, for it's out of our brokenness we made whole. Or there's a superficial response to sin that leads only to a superficial repentance with no brokenness, no humility, no true fellowship with God, just a ticketed Christianity. I've got my ticket. But there's no life. There's no power. Now, I know that sin, when we talk about it, there are sins that we fall short of the character of God. We, we, we sin with regularity. But there are particular sins. Some of them are intentional. And if they're not now, they were, but they become a, got a grip on us. And David's heart was broken over the superficial forgiveness that had been offered to his son, but never made serious. And God wants you and me to live in a serious relationship where we've come out to come in to enjoy the fullness of his presence and his love and his power. Did you know that healthy discipline actually creates a sense of security in children? Perhaps it's because we intuitively understand that discipline can be and often is an expression of love. David experienced painful discipline from God and it served to restore their relationship. Charles Price talked about the difference between a superficial response to sin and a serious response to sin. Um, how can we tell for ourselves which response we are having? When we truly connect with how much we've hurt God and hurt others, mm -hmm. and we have that sense of, of the, the full remorse for our sin, I think that's on a very deep spiritual level. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's something that God actually gives us as a gift, that we can truly see what sin means and what it does to people. If I'm more concerned with how I'm going to appear in the midst of the consequences, then I know it's superficial. Mm -hmm. But if I'm truly weighing what I've done and allowing God to do kind of that open heart surgery and not so much concerned about the consequences, then I know that he's at work and it's not me just trying to cover up my tracks. Mm -hmm. Because Satan can be and is the accuser, so he can make us feel guilty or accuse us of things, how can we discern between remorse from, from God or, you know, accusation or, you know, guilt from the enemy? I always feel when God is pinpointing something that I need to repent of or ask someone their forgiveness for, it, it's, it is specific. And you know immediately, you're right, I do have to do that. 
Yeah, I think in Corinthians, Paul talks about godly sorrow bringing repentance, and it, it, it again was a moment where people aren't worried about their own reputation in the mm -hmm. midst of it. They're just wanting to do what's right, not what's easy. And uh, I think there's an indicator there for us. I think very much as a parent with my own kids, I, you know, I love them to death and they don't question my love. But when I'm disciplining them, they, they feel a different form of love. And sometimes when I'm talking to them in the midst of the discipline, I'm telling them that I'm trying to help them make the right choices and the right decisions so that later on in life, when the choices have larger consequences, um, they're prepared and they've cultivated the necessary muscles mm. to resist whatever temptations facing them. You know, when you're seven, eight, nine years old, it's candy and, and maybe sneaking some candy that your parents said you shouldn't have mm -hmm. and your friends are helping you do that. But once you get into the teenage years, those very friends, it's no longer candy, it's some other uh, object that could have more serious consequences. And when I look through Scripture, that's what God's always doing. He's always teaching His people to choose what is right, mm -hmm. choose the path mm -hmm. of obedience, not because He's a, a dictator or uh, into whatever it is. He's not trying to hold out on us. Right. He wants to bless us, and that blessing comes with doing it His way, not our ways. Mm -hmm. So His discipline's always, always trying to cultivate a healthy choice in your life, mm -hmm. even though it's painful. Why do you think the word discipline or discipline itself gets such a, a negative connotation in our culture? At least I think it does. We hear the word and it's, I know. I, I think our culture is tipped into reaction because perhaps in the past, um, discipline was a little heavy handed. Maybe there was too much, um, you know, corporal punishment or all those mm -hmm. type of things that people had issues with. Um, and so I think then people flipped the other way. The pendulum um, swing. Yeah, it really did. And so now um, it's like a dirty word saying discipline. Um, and, uh, and yet it's, it's really a, a beautiful thing, a completely necessary thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard a quote years ago and it stuck with me uh, about coaches. And it said, coaches, a good coach makes you do the things you don't want to do so that you become the player you've always wanted to be. And I think discipline uh, mm -hmm. at times gets a bad uh, rap in our culture because very much we don't want to do the work. We want the benefit, mm -hmm. but not the hard work it takes to reap that benefit. Mm -hmm. And so our perspective towards discipline is negative because mm -hmm. we just want the quick fix. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not the way it works. Thanks yeah. for sharing that one. Yeah. Sin, by its very nature, bears consequences. But the good news is that God loves us enough to discipline us, to train us, because He desires relationship with us. Thank you for, for sharing today, for your input. You well, totally understand it's for the... Join Living Truth as we travel by luxury coach to beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. From May 8th to the 11th, 2017. Your wonderful adventure includes a guided sightseeing tour through Amish country, a steam train ride, a visit to historical Hershey, Pennsylvania, and more. Your visit to Lancaster also includes a live performance of the epic adventure Jonah at the renowned Sight and Sound Theater. The classic Bible story of Jonah springs to life on stage in jaw-dropping scale with spectacular special effects and live animals. You'll also enjoy three nights at the beautiful Eden Resort Hotel. Contact us early to reserve your ticket. Call. Christian Journeys at 1-877-465-3442 or visit online. Be a part of this wonderful Living Truth experience. See you in Lancaster, May 8th to the 11th, 2017. Our salvation is a free gift from God, and yet it will cost us everything we have to walk closely with Him. His grace is not cheap. 
and we have to learn to hate sin so that we never take forgiveness lightly. God requires a broken, chastised heart to lead us into wholeness. In the life of King David, it is the painful discipline of God that is the greatest love story of all. Let's view that discipline not as a thing to be feared, but as a gift to us so we can find our way home. Join us next time for more Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. Join us next week for a special Easter message from Charles Price, right here on Living Truth. Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.